Okay, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that everyone's 2016 is off to a fabulous start. I am Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix, and today Jamie Bartle, our field ap Senior Field Application Scientist, will take us on a walk through GWAS. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, as Cheryl said, my name is Jamie Bartle, and I am the Senior Field Application Scientist here at Golden Helix. My responsibilities um, with Golden Helix involve showing our customers the software through demos and training sessions as well as helping them out with support issues and testing the software as well. So I have a lot of experience working with our products in different workflows and different situations and so I'm happy to present this webcast to you today. Uh, during the presentation if you do have any questions feel free to use the questions pane in your go to in your GoTo webinar window. Um, you can enter in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, but don't worry if we don't get to your question we will contact you with responses as well. <clears throat> For those of you who are new to Golden Helix I'm going to show you some brief information or introductory slides just to let you know um, who we are as a company and where we got started. Uh, for those of you who are current customers, of course, we also um, can remind you of this information so that you can really know how important you are to our success and how much we want to be a part of your success as well. Golden Helix was founded in 1998. Our founder spun off from early work with GlaxoSmithKline and GSK was a key investor in the company. Golden Helix started out creating products for genomics and bioinformatics with our Helix Tree software platform, which has since become SNP and Variation Suite, or SVS, which is more commonly the name. We have since added our two new products, Genome Browse, in both a standalone version and our Varseek software as well. With these products, the company has over 17 years of experience in bioinformatics and has been cited in over 900 peer review publications. These publications include, of course, Nature and Nature Genetics, as you can see, as well as a wide variety of other sources. Golden Helix serves over 200 um, organizations worldwide, including some top-tier research organizations and clinical labs, some major government institutions and pharma pharma genomics companies. Um, this leads to thousands of users who trust our software in their labs and with their research. We are very proud of the fact that when you buy a product from Golden Helix, you're getting more than just a piece of software. We have a rep rep reputation for quality products, excellent customer service, and domain expertise. We also have the experience of developing software for over 17 years with a wide range of experts on staff, including biostatisticians, mathematicians, and software engineers. We earn the trust of our customers by reaching out and understanding our customers and their needs. Um, we take the time to research relevant topic topics and publish blogs and ebooks on subjects to gain knowledge and pass on what we've learned to through the community. Our team of experts are available to provide the resources needed to help complete your analysis, starting from training all the way through to technical support. We support our customers every step of the way, and this includes documentation for all of our major methods and algorithms, which can include some formulas, some examples, as well as article citations for each of our methods. If you ever have any questions as you are working through the software or just examining it, feel free to give us a call or um, send us an email, and we'll be more than happy to get you through and help you out with the software to answer your questions. For the presentation today, we are mainly going to be focusing on our SNP and Variation Suite, our SVS software for GWAS analysis. Um, this particular software suite was created specifically for genetic research and initially developed in, in the GWAS era. The performance and usability of visualizations um, have made the software an obvious and popular choice for genetic researchers. More recently, as the world of genetic research evolves, the software has, of course, numerous tools to account for the variety of workflows. SVS now includes workflows for GWAS, CNV, both RNA and DNA sequencing workflows. And we also have an incredible and intuitive visualization that's powered by our genome browse software. 
with GWAS data, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, most of the genome browse features that we're actually going to be looking at are going to be involved in visualizing genomic plots. So in particular, our Man Manhattan plots and our LD plot functionality that are going to correspond to our GWAS workflows. But genome browse itself, um, as a standalone product, um, can be used quite well for DNA seq and RNA sequence and data and support it's most of the um, standard formats, so BAM and VCF files as well as BED files for that particular format. As an approximate agenda for today, we're just going to, I'm going to go ahead and start out with just a brief background of GWAS just so we can talk about some of the options that we're going to be looking at today. And then we're going to be exploring results from a completed GWAS project. In particular, we're going to be discussing the population stratification that exists in the data. And then once again, at the end of the, the webcast, we're going to have some time for a question and answer session. So for our brief background of GWAS, and by brief, I mean a single slide, so it shouldn't take us too long to get through it. Uh, in general, GWAS started with very naive approaches, such as just standard correlation trend tests and linear and logistic regression. All of these methods assumed independence of samples, which means that no batch effects existed, um, the same array platform used for cases and controls, um, and they're all processed in the same lab under the same conditions. Of course, as, as we have learned, um, this is not exactly realistic, and so it was quickly realized that, that new tools were needed to um, handle batch effects, um, microarray plate effects, population structure for humans, inbreeding for animals and other sources of cryptic relation, relatedness which could cause issues and could not be ignored. Not to mention, of course, the cost is also a big factor, as most of you know. Um, the cost of, that is associated with genotyping cases and controls led to a lot, has led to a lot of sharing of control samples. And of course, the problem with sharing controls is that you cannot ensure samples were processed in the same way under the same conditions. So basically, what we need to do is we need to look at a way to adjust for the violations um, that our samples were independent. And so part of the discussion that we are going to have today is going to look into methods of resolving some population stratification issues. The summary project, or the project that we're going to be looking at today, um, was a data set that was downloaded from the Gene Expression Omnibus. Um, it's a data set that contained 513 individuals from 29 populations um, that was provided by the Human Genome Diversity Project. All of the data was genotyped on the aluminum uh, infin infinium um, hap map genotyping B-chip, and we also simulated a case control phenotype within the data just to, to give you uh, some good uh, expression of what you'll see within the data and what our software can be used to actually do the analysis. And so let's go ahead and just jump right into our um, SVS project. And so on my screen here, you should see SVS open. Those of you who are film familiar with SVS should recognize the, the formats that we're looking at here. SVS is a project-based program, and so what you're going to see within a single project is all of the data you've imported and the analysis that you've completed in these lovely little node trees so that we can you can keep track of um, the order in which you did things as well as not lose any pertinent information as you move from step to step. Um, because we're doing a GWAS, let's just go ahead and let's just jump right to the end of the process and let's take a look at some results because, of course, we always like to read the last page in the book so that we don't miss any important information. And so what I'm looking at right here is a Manhattan plot of a basic association test. So this association test is just a naive association test. All we've done with the data prior to this is just some, some, some very minimal QC. So we've looked at some QC um, based on sample statistics and marker statistics, and then we just went ahead and uh, ran a correlation trend test against our binary phenotype of interest. And what you should see within, our, um, within this particular view is, of course, these are all the p-values that were provided for our markers. In this particular data set, we had about 500,000 markers and, once again, uh, um, pretty close to about 500 samples. 
you'll see that we do have a little bit of a peak happening here in chromosome 7. If I want to go ahead and zoom into this location so I can take a, a, a look closer at those results, I'm going to go ahead and just drag my mouse across and zoom into this location. Um, there's many different zoom methods in Genome Browse. I can also use my scroll wheel and just scroll up and it should zoom me in a little bit further. And what you're going to see in this context, of course, is your p-values. Um, as soon as you get in close enough, you're going to start to see the um, RSID values or the SNP identifiers that are used in your spreadsheet. In this case, we have RSIDs. Additionally, we do have a gene source loaded as well so that we can see where those RSIDs fall inside of the genes. So we've got um, two variants up here that of, of interest to us that are, are sitting at that high point right around the nine mark. Um, this is a genome-wide significant and we do have some um, other markers in that same region kind of providing support for this particular analysis. If I click on any of these points down in my data console, I'm going to see further information from the spreadsheets. So I can see my exact p-value that's present in the data um, as well as the supporting values for actually computing that particular value. Now, with correlation trend tests, generally the first thing that you want to check, of course, is that your particular SNP doesn't um, invalidate any of the assumptions of the test. In particular, you want to guarantee that your genotype counts are sufficient so that your contingency table for actually computing that p-value is sufficient. So what we're looking for, of course, is counts over five in that particular contingency table. We have a couple of different ways within um, SVS to actually look at that contingency table. One of the ways is just through the output that is available from the association testing. I can output genotype counts. If I scroll down here to the bottom, what I'm looking for is the counts of um, my minor allele for my cases, my minor allele for my controls, and also uh, my heterozygous counts and my um, homozygous uh, major alleles as well. We all want all those values to be greater than five to prove that these p-values are, are um, can be trusted. And so in this case, it looks like we've got a 45, a 9, 119, 88, 86, 133. So all of those are sufficient and pass our test. So this RS209 um, p-value, we can, we, can, we, can, we can generally trust. Um, I'm going to click on this other one right here just to show you another option for actually computing contingency tables. I'm just going to copy this value, and I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet from when this data was provided. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this spreadsheet, and what you should see in the spreadsheet, this is the data we actually ran the association testing on. We see our binary case control phenotype, and then all of our genotypes follow along. We have uh, an add-on script available in our scripts repository uh, that will allow you to compute a frequency table, and that particular script is just called frequency table. It can be downloaded from our website, and I will provide links to that location in the slides for, for the webcast as well. So if you want access to this particular table, and it just asks you for two different values to compute that frequency from. So I'm going to go ahead and choose my case control value, and then I'm going to select my SNP of interest, keeping in mind that I did just copy and paste it in there so I can go ahead and just grab it really easily. And then go ahead and run the script. Once again, this is a Python script, so it just takes a couple of seconds to finish. And so what you'll notice with this particular test is that, or this particular SNP of interest, is that a lot of the, the values, or at least two of them that we're looking at, um, in this case, these are our missing ones, which are going to be ignored. Um, so those ones don't really matter, but our ones here are all above five, so we can go ahead and um, pass this SNP through our QC as well. And so for the two SNPs of interest in this particular data set um, that show up on our plot right here at the very top, they have passed the assumptions of the correlation trend test. And so our next step would be to take a look and see how our p-values overall are doing within this particular test. We want to look specifically to see if there's any inflation in the data. Um, that may be a result of, of not doing enough QC or not accounting for enough possible um, differences within your data sets. And so the way that we generally do that is with a QQ plot. Opening up the results for this particular data set, what you'll see is you'll see the information that was provided by the association test. Once again, we did a correlation trend test. So that negative log 10 p-value is what we plotted in our Manhattan plot. And everything else is the associated values to compute those. For our QQ plot, 
I'm just going to plot an XY scatter plot. What we actually like to look at is our expected negative log 10 p values um, against our actual observed values. We'll go ahead and plot that for us. And of course, it opened up on my other screen. Um, but here's what it looks like. To get an idea of whether or not your values are inflated or not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare it to a y equal to x line. And what you can see once I've added that particular line is that we have quite a bit of inflation that's happening within our data set right here. Our um, observed values are quite a bit higher than what the expected values are. In general, with most association tests, what you would like to see is you would like to see your p-values follow this line to about 3 and then diverge um, at that particular point. I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint slide really quickly because I have a couple of different plots that I can show you um, to just make a comparison. So the plot that we were just looking at is this one up here in the upper left hand corner that shows our inflation and I went ahead and added the inflation factor for these values as well. Um, our straight association tests will allow you to compute this factor directly into the um, project as well and we do have an add-on script that if you forget to actually select that that you can run it on any p-value column later on to find those lambda or inflation factor values. So once again here is an example of something that's inflated. Um, the one up here in the upper left hand corner there is a little bit um, under inflated so it's, it's sitting below that line just a little bit so whatever analysis created this particular plot probably overcorrected the data a little bit as it the um, observed values are actually less than the expected values. The bottom plot here is actually what we do want to see for our particular data set. So once again the p-values are following the line up to about 3 and then they're going above the line and increasing to our significant p-values after that particular um, junction. And so when you see inflated values, of course, the first thing you want to ask yourself is why is this happening? And so let's go ahead and we'll take a look back at our workflow that we completed to get to this, this point to see if we can figure out why that inflation is actually occurring for our values. So jumping back into my data set, at the very first, what we did, of course, was imported the study samples. So here are all the genotypes that were present along with all of the samples that were present in that data set. And so the very first step, um, was looking at sample statistics. Um, sample statistics is underneath the genotype menu, um, genotype statistics by sample, and what we're looking for in this particular tool by default is we're looking for call rate information um, as well as some heterozygosity information. This particular data set doesn't have any um, X or Y chromosomes in it, so we can't actually do any kind of like gender inference, but if you did have X and Y chromosomes, um, those options would be available uh, in this section right here if you did have that data available. By default, we're going to see call rate and heterozygosity rate. And so we can do some um, checking of our data based on that information. So if we take a look at the results, here are our statistics by samples. And I did just run it with the default options of call rate and heterozygosity. As a first step, let's just go ahead and we'll look at this call rate function. You can, of course, right-click on it and sort it in descending or ascending order, depending on, you know, if you want to actually be able to click through the data to see what's happening. But we can also more easily draw a histogram of the data to get a better scope of what's happening um, throughout the entire data set. I'm just going to increase the bin count a little bit so we get a little bit of differences. And what you'll see with this particular plot is that the majority of our data or the majority of our um, samples fall, you know, above that 95% call rate, but we do have some samples with some poor call rate that are still present in our data. And so in general, before doing any further analysis, you would want to exclude those samples that do have that, that low call rate values that are available. So for this particular project, before I did run the association test, I did go ahead and filter based on that call rate function, and I just excluded any samples that had a call rate less than 95%, um, which gives me this subset right here. It actually excluded about 17 samples, and so if you take a look at this particular subset, you should see that we're down to about 480. Oops, it actually excluded 19. I apologize. Um, samples about that. Once you have your set of informative samples, um, in this case we want to look for um, both 
population stratification as well as any cryptic relatedness in your samples. So as a very first step to doing that, the very first thing that you want to do is you want to remove any markers that are in high LD with one another. And through the genotype menu and our quality assurance submenu, you can go ahead and do LD pruning directly. Um, this particular, depending on the uh, window size and the options that you've selected, can, can take a little bit of time to finish. So of course, I've gone ahead and done that for the webcast today already. Um, just using the default options for this particular data set. And once we did that, what you'll see in this particular case is we've actually um, dropped about half of our markers. And so we're down to a little bit over 250,000 markers after removing any that are in high LD with one another. Once we have that done, we can go ahead and run um, our cryptic relatedness tests, which in general involve creating a genomic relationship matrix. Once again, under the genotype menu, quality assurance submenu, um, we're looking specifically in this case at an identity by descent estimation. But for example, if your data um, is non-human or even human, there's also the option to use a GBLUP genomic relationship matrix. This one is generally more useful if you're going to be, if you have um, like animal data and you're going to be doing genomic prediction, then that's sometimes the preferred source. For this case, we use the identity by descent matrix, and there are a couple of different options for output. We can output IBS distances directly, and then we can output the, the estimated um, PI values as well. So I'm outputting both of these options. Generally, you only want to use one for your relatedness filtering or determination, um, but you can use either one of them. There's also some um, median information available, as well as an example of if you think your data is highly related or you have some related samples and you want to exclude some of the values, then you can go ahead and output um, the paired PIs so that you can use that information for filtering your samples, maybe excluding one of the samples that's in relation to another one. Once again, I ran that already. Um, and let's just take a look at our IBD estimate. This is just a matrix. It's samples by samples. So we had 480 samples with this value between 0 and 1, 0 indicating unrelated and 1 indicating that the samples, it's either duplicate samples or possibly identical twins. And generally with unrelated samples, you want these values to be below about 0.2, if not lower than that. The easiest way to look at this information is through a heat map. I can go ahead and click this little heat map icon, or I can also access it through the plot menu. We'll click it on the icon this morning. Now the default coloring for this heat map is a little bit busy for our needs. Um, just to click on this value to so see how we're coloring. Um, red is actually colored as our unrelated samples and one is our related samples. I'm gonna go ahead and just do a manual process. I'm gonna get rid of those red values as they are just kind of clogging up the data a little bit. And I'm going to edit this value to be that 0 0.0 or 0.2 to get us a, a good description or a good relationship of these particular samples. You could add another value if you want to look at more um, differences. Maybe you want to add in like 0.5 if you want to see um, sibling relationships and so on and so forth. What you'll see is that we're mostly seeing white, but we do have a couple of areas where we do have some green um, dots that are outside the horizontal. Um, the diagonal line, excuse me. The diagonal is the same sample compared to each other, so of course it should be one. And then there's some marginally related samples. What you'll see is 0 0.27, um, 0.5533 um, for these particular samples. This is kind of a way where if you have some unknown relatedness in your, maybe your control data set, you're not really sure, this is a way to kind of check and see how those relationships lie out. Most of the data within this sample is fairly unrelated. That's why we're seeing a lot of white. So for the analysis, I chose not to exclude any samples based on relationships. For the next option in this particular data set, we want to go ahead and look at population stratification within the data. And so to determine population stratification, what we want to do is we want to take our LD prune data set and we want to join it up to a reference population of known populations. And so in this particular case, I had a reference panel already loaded in, so I went ahead and joined those two data sets together and then ran principal component analysis. And so under the genotype menu, genotype principal components, to start out, we comp I computed the principal components. 
And by definition, we can compute up to 1 minus the number of samples. So if I wanted to compute, I can compute 106 for this particular data set because that was my um, 480 study samples and then my little over 600 um, reference population samples. So 1 minus the number of samples gives me 1106. Generally, you don't need that many to see the full um, stratification that's happening within your data, but of course, um, Time-wise, it generally doesn't take any more time to compute that many in. So for our model options, um, the association testing that we're running, we're running an additive model. So when we do our principal components, we also want to choose that same model. Um, additive model in this case is, is looking at the number of minor alleles that are present. So either 0, 1, or 2 when it's doing its recoding. And you'll get two outputs from this particular run. The first thing is going to be um, a list of all the eigenvalues of your data. And when looking at this information, what you're doing is you're looking for um, when these values start to be very similar to one another. And so when the changes, so you'll, what you'll see is there's quite a bit of difference between the first three eigenvalues that are sitting here. But once I get past that, um, there really is not much of a change. Um, Basically, once you get past six, there's very little differences between these. And so generally, when I'm looking to maybe correct the data, if I want to do that at one point, probably either correcting by three principal components or at most six um, would get us full correction on the data. But of course, just looking at spreadsheets of numbers is not all that exciting. And so um, actually looking at our principal components, what we want to do is we want to create a, a principal component plot. And if we want to be able to have some nice pretty pictures and that are colored based on our populations, then the first step before we create those plots is we want to join our data up to our population spreadsheet. So I do have a population spreadsheet that lists all of the samples, including my study samples, as its own category. So all of my samples in this particular data set. I'm going to go to File and Join or Merge, and I'm going to grab that Principal Components Additive Model. And the default options are what I'm going to keep and dropping the spreadsheet underneath my current population data spreadsheet. And once again, this is just so that I can do some coloring of my plots once I actually look at them. So what you'll see in the resulting spreadsheet, of course, is my first three population information and then all of my principal components are going to follow after that. So principal component plot is just an XY scatter plot of the first two co components against one another. So we're going to choose our first component here and our second component here, and go ahead and hit plot. And what you'll see is there is quite a separation between the data. Once again, I can color this based on my population information by selecting the graph node right here, selecting color, and then by a particular variable. And I'm going to select the region variable in this particular case. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. I'm going to open up this colors just so that you can see what's happening within the data. Um, we do automatically color things, and every once in a while, some of the colors that are picked are going to be the same as other colors. So what you'll notice is I want to know which ones are my study populations, which are green, but my America samples are also categorized as a similar color green. I'm going to go ahead and just switch those to yellow so that I can really see where my population or my study population is is fixated towards. And so what you'll see, my study population, I've got some down here um, near the East Asian samples. I've also got some up here um, near my European samples. And then I've got a spattering of them out towards um, my African samples as well. So in this particular data set, um, you know, we are matching possibly against some Middle, Middle Eastern samples, um, maybe some you know, we've got a couple of spattering out here towards our South Central Asia. If we want to actually see one more um, degree within our data, instead of doing a 2D plot, which I've done here is my first two principal components, we actually have a new feature that allows you to do a 3D plot so that you can see one more level of, or one more dimension. It's also under the plot menu. It is an add-on script. I'm going to add in this time the first three components so that I can see how they relate. And then I'm going to choose my coloring or my grouping variable as that region variable once again. Go ahead and create this particular plot. And we'll make it just the size of the screen so that we can really get an idea. 
Now this plot is pretty is pretty good and we can see a lot. We can also just hold down our mouse and we can move it around a little bit so that we can actually see how those dimensions change if we want to get a really good picture of how our data is working out. In this particular plot, um, the colors are generated by default and so our study samples are actually black in this case. So what you'll see is that, yeah, our samples are definitely grouping um, by the East Asian samples. They're definitely grouping up here by our um, European samples, which are the blue ones, and they're definitely grouping out here by our African samples. And you can see that there are actually some samples in the, in the data set that are actually pretty far removed from um, our populations. And so with this particular data set, um, it actually works out that three principal components explain the majority of the stratification. And so um, that right there, that principal components and that population stratification is looking like what is causing the issue or causing that inflation with our results for our association tests. So we want to go ahead and try to correct our data um, based on that information. And so I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint slides really quickly just so that we can discuss the different methods that are available. So once again, we started out with that naive GWAS, so we just did a correlation trend test after doing some basic quality control of samples um, and markers. We didn't really look at the um, results for the markers, but, but I did just do some basic um, call rate filtering, minor allele frequency filtering, got rid of anything that was less than 1%, um, did some Hardy-Weinberg filtering based on the controls um, for the marker test to get us um, where we got to those particular inflated values. And so we've identified that that population stratification is really causing the issue. So we want to do a GWAS and we want to include correcting for that population stratification. Um, so we're going to look at three different options for actually doing that correction. The first option we're going to look at is just directly correcting the genotype and phenotype data within the association test itself. Um, the method that we use for PCA is the eigenstrat prince method, which once again is um, listed in our manual along with some reference sources if you want to read more information about that. The second option um, within this particular uh, bucket is we're just going to add those principal components um, as covariates to our regression model, so we're going to look at how to do that. And then last but not least, we can actually um, use the mixed model approach of using a genomic relationship matrix to account for stratification within the data. And so those are, are what we're going to be looking at um, further on. So going back to our project, once again, this is my filtered data for association testing. So this is my data that's been filtered um, down based on my samples and also based on my marker statistics that I did choose earlier, leaving me with 480 samples and a little over 500,000 markers. Once again, I have my binary case control phenotype and all of my genotype information. So the first method that we, we listed for correcting for population stratification was just directly within the association testing dialog. So under the genotype menu, genotype association tests, we're going to go ahead and once again look at that additive model. And the options to correct for stratification is right here, um, down here where I correct for stratification with PCA. And then the PCA parameters that I set are going to be on this second tab right here. Now you can either recompute your principal components based on this study sample or you can or you can do it previously to actually running this. Um, I did run it previously on just this sample data, keeping only those three principal components that I identified active. Any of the ones that are active in this spreadsheet will be used for correction. So for example, if you ran over 1,100 um, principal components and then you tried to correct your data, you would correct for all of them. And I can guarantee um, that the data will definitely be overcorrected at that particular point. So just going to correct for three principal components within the data and also select the option to show that inflation factor of the data once it's done. Something to keep in mind with this particular method, even though we started with a binary case control phenotype, this particular method actually corrects the phenotype data as well as the genotype data. So what you're left with in terms of tests or methods that you're looking at are going to be those that are related to a quantitative phenotype and numeric data. So correlation trend test still applies, but it's based off of a quantitative phenotype instead of that original case control phenotype. If I wasn't selecting that um, stratification, then I would have further options available um, based on the fact that I'm using a binary phenotype instead of that quantitative value.
Once again, went ahead and run this, um, also outputting some additional statistics of genotype counts in case I want to take a look at that um, for validation of results at a later point. When you run that, the, the values that you're going to see or the results that you're going to see are going to be very similar to what we've seen before. Um, once again, I'm going to get my um, p-value, negative log 10 p-value, and associated information. I can go ahead and once again sort this in descending order so that any of my um, markers of interest are going to pop to the top. And what you'll see is that RS209 that we actually identified as significant before is still significant after I've corrected my data for three principal components. And if we, once again, we want to take a look um, at the inflation factor, it was output with the results. So it's output um, right here. So we actually have a inflation factor of just a little over one, which is actually a very good inflation factor. And we can also do that once again um, with a QQ plot to actually look at it visually as well to, to verify that what we're looking at is actually good. Adding our straight line so that we can see that comparison. And what you'll see is that we're following up till about three. Um, with this particular data set, we do have a little bit of a dip um, once we get past four, so we maybe overcorrected the data a little bit with this particular method. Um, so maybe another method would be more appropriate, but this is still a, a fairly decent QQ plot that we're looking at with our significant SNPs still popping out. So there's one way of doing it. The next way is to actually um, use a regression model and add those covariate or add those principal components in as covariates. So to run numeric regression within the software, the very first thing that you have to do is you have to convert your genotypes um, to numeric values. We can do that quite easily within the software just through the edit menu, recode, recode genotypes, and then select one of the um, models based on your choice of tests. So once again, we've been testing the additive model quite seriously, and so keeping along with that additive model. Additive model, once again, is going to be count the number of minor alleles that are present in the data based on allele frequencies of each particular marker in the data set. What you'll get when you do this is, a, once again, an output that looks very similar. Our case control variable is still binary, so that's zeros and ones. But our markers have now become integer values of 0, 1, and 2. One last thing that we need to do before we can actually go ahead and proceed with our numeric regression is that all of the data has to be in one spreadsheet before we can actually do the analysis. And so before we can actually um, jump into running the numerical analysis, I need to join up my principal components, those three ones that I want to add as covariates. So I've gone ahead and done that. So once again, our binary case control dependent variable, there's my three principal components. And following that is going to be my numeric SNP data. And so regression is accessed through the numeric menu. Numeric regression analysis is just our standard analysis. We want one test per marker so that we get one p-value per marker. So we're going to regress on each of our uh, over 500,000 numeric columns and we're going to correct for some covariates. We're going to add them as reduced model covariates because I want to remove um, that effect from my model before I'm testing my p-value. And so I'm going to add them as reduced model covariates before I go ahead and hit run. Output from that, it's going to look very similar to most basic regression results, and is that we're, of course, going to get groups of information. The full versus reduced model p-value is going to be the p-value of interest to it. It's the one we're going to look at when testing um, how significant our p-value is after having removed the effect of those principal components. Once again, I can go ahead and look at a scatter plot, or I can just look at the inflation factor. So let's go ahead and look at our expected values and our actual values again. Because you can't get, you can't see too many QQ plots, right? And so, once again, this is a fairly decent um, QQ plot. We're following the line up quite a bit. Once again, there's a little bit of dip once you get past four, but it's actually not dropping below the line this time. Um, so this may be uh, the best choice so far. Um, if we want to know what that inflation factor is, this particular option doesn't allow you to compute inflation factors directly, but there's once again an add-on script that we can use that can compute a pseudo lambda value. Um, I've downloaded and saved that script in my column menu, so it's right here down at the bottom. I can calculate a pseudo lambda. I can also calculate a pseudo lambda with a chi-squared distribution, either, either one of those. 
My pseudo lambda for this particular p-value data set is once again just a little bit over one. So it's very similar to when we were uh, correcting directly within the association testing for our analysis. Last but not least for the data, um, the last test that we actually that I were actually going to look at from this particular data set is a mixed model. And so starting from our genotypes, this time binary case control, my genotype spreadsheet, I'm going to go under the genotype menu and select my mixed linear model analysis. For parameters that I'm going to select, I'm going to go ahead and just look at the single locus model, which is just testing one SNP at a time and how its significance relates. We're going to correct for our stratification using a kinship matrix. In this case, we're going to use our pre-computed IBD matrix. So I'm going to go ahead and select that one. And then all of the default options in this particular dialog are what we're going to choose, including any additional outputs um, for our QQ and PP plots. And go ahead and hit OK and run that value. And once again, we're looking at p-values again. So let's go ahead and just sort this in descending. Let's see if we're still getting those significant SNPs. Absolutely we are. Going to go ahead and um, check our QQ plot really quickly, make sure we've made the correct selections before we do that. Let's see how our inflation is working out. And what you'll see is that, once again, with this particular correction method, they're all very similar and giving us fairly simple results. The, the actual inflation on this worked out to be about 1.04, um, so it's not quite as good as the other options that we've chosen. Um, but still, this is a, a fairly decent um, QQ plot because we're following that line up to about 3, and then we're skewing from that. And so any of these methods are giving us good values. If we want to compare what we're seeing um, in these results to our results from before. I'm going to go ahead and open up my Manhattan plot um, from my naive correlation trend test so I can see those um, values of interest to me. And I'm going to go ahead and add um, results from one of our other studies. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and add, I'm going to add the, the results from the regression analysis because that was the one that looked the best as far as the QQ plot was concerned. And I'm going to add the negative 10 p value in, in the full versus reduced model. And what you'll see is in this particular area, it's the one that just got added up at top. Those values that were significant before are still significant. Um, and But what you're going to see is a lot of the noise or the inflation of the p-values that are at lower values, those are actually going to be reduced or stamped down because we've reduced that inflation of our data. And so this is overall um, probably a much, much better test for us than the one that we did without any population stratification whatsoever. So once again, I can click on any of these to get further details. I can get my actual p-values, my regression results, any of that further information. Um, with genome browse plots, we can look at everything in context with one another. I'm going to go ahead and, and close that correlation trend test. Um, and we can add more information if we want to look further into here. I can click on the gene name. I can link out to NCBI or Hugo to learn more about this particular gene. Um, we do have additional data sources that are available. In particular, with GWAS studies, we have the GWAS catalog, um, which is a list of SNPs that have been identified in different GWAS results or studies. And so what you can see is if for this particular gene, I'm going to double click on it, there have been a couple of studies for SNPs in this gene, but nobody has in particular identified this RS2009. Um, so maybe we've got some, some good results that we can provide for this particular source. Once again, we simulated the case control, so we don't have any particular disease that we were looking at. But for your data, if you had a disease of interest, it might um, show you that value. Um, it's possible that these other SNPs that were identified are maybe in high LD with these ones. We can go ahead and add a, an LD plot of our study samples. to the plot as well so that we can see how these um, SNPs are related to one another. And what you'll see is there's some high LD happening right in here. If I zoom in a little bit, um, we can see that there's really not too much happening between this SNP of interest and, and ours. We've got a lot of blue in there. And so it's probably not in high LD with that one. But we can look further into our data and, and look into our results before actually publishing. So for this particular um, data set that we've looked at, just as kind of a summary of what we've talked about. 
Um, we performed first a basic association test, and um, part of the results of that particular test, we wanted to verify that the p-values we were seeing were correct. So we verified using a contingency table, um, and that script that I was talking about was the frequency table script that's available on our website at this particular site. And then we looked at the QQ plot to look for inflation of our p-values. Um, and once again, the pseudo lambda calculations are available on our website at this particular link. Once we identified that there was an inflation of our p-values, we examined our workflow to determine reasons for the inflations. So we looked through our sample statistics, um, call rate histograms to see how filtering was done. We looked at the cryptic relatedness through IBD, through a heat map. And then we looked at our population stratification with PCA, both in a 2D and a 3D plot. And this was what was identified to be the issue or the cause of uh, the inflation that we were seeing within the data. And so our adjusted analysis for population stratification included using PCA from, from the association testing dialogue, um, adding those as covariates to the numeric regression, and doing a mixed linear model analysis. Um, all of these methods that we've used, and there's probably many more that you can to adjust the analysis, if you want to go ahead and run one of those methods on your data and you just want to help getting it set up or getting the data in a format so that it can run, you know, just let us know. We'll be more than willing to help you out. And so if you do have any questions, um, you know, feel free to type them into the question pane right now. I believe that Cheryl has some announcements for you first before we actually jump into the questions. I do. Thank you, Jamie. Um, let's see. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we're going to answer some questions. Type them in if you haven't yet. Um, quick announcements for me. If you haven't checked it out yet, we are hosting our third annual abstract challenge. Um, everyone with a project project scope focusing on DNA-seq, RNA-seq, GWAS, or even C and V is welcome to submit their abstracts. The easiest way to find out more information is just to enter abstract into the search bar on our website. Um, we will pick three winners and each of those will receive some free software for a year as well as the first prize winner taking home a new laptop. Um, and then we also give the winners the opportunity to present their work to our community via webcast as well. Um, the recording and slides from today's webcast will be up on our website on Friday. I will also email those to you, so keep your eyes out in your inbox for those. Our next webcast will be coming up on February 3rd. This will be a very exciting webcast for Golden Helix. Our CEO and President, Dr. Andrea Scherer, along with our VP of Engineering and Product, Gabe Rudy, will be introducing a brand new product for the Golden Helix team. I'll email invitations out for that tomorrow, so keep your eyes peeled. That's all for me, so we will answer some questions. Keep in mind, if we don't get to your question, we can email them out. We do have quite a few at this point. Um, let's see. What reference panel did you use? Um, for this particular data set, um, the reference pan panel was also um, downloaded from the GEO website, which is the same website and the same information we got. Um, or the initial download of the data. So the reference panel was provided um, as that source as well. Are the po is the population data self-reported or calculated based on SNP allele frequencies? Um, the population uh, information for, for the um, reference population was um, self-reported with this particular data set. And so it wasn't calculated based on allele frequencies. Oop. Sorry, bear with me, everyone. The, the questions are rolling in and they keep popping my screen around. Um, <laughs> using the mixed model analysis, can we use the PCA results like an additional covariate? Absolutely. Um, you know, as part of the, the what we were looking at or what we had time for today, I just showed three possible methods for correcting for that population stratification. Um, and what you notice is that the we didn't actually directly add the PCs into the mixed model. Um, 
and we did get a, a pretty good correction of that inflation values, but if you did just a straight mixed model without um, looking at population stratification and you still saw some inflation, then adding those principal components as covariates is definitely um, you know, an accepted workflow. Um, so I just basically showed three options for today, but there are many more. To share analysis with collaborators, do they need to have purchased an SVS license or can they be shared in a reader or a Python notebook? Um, so SVS has the SVS viewer available for free um, that can be downloaded by anybody. So a license is not required to actually open and view the projects that are done, um, but you can't do any further analysis on them through that viewer. And that uh, SVS viewer is actually available for download right on our website, and you can get some great example projects like a GWAS project in there to walk through. So feel free to download one of those at random. Um, how do you deal with overcorrected samples? Um, I mean, in in general, if you if you're overcorrecting. It depends on how you're overcorrecting. Um, you know, if it's if you're just running a straight naive approach and you're getting some overcorrection, um, you may have to exclude some samples from your data set to get better results. Uh, if you're actually correcting for principal components, say you've chosen three but you've overcorrected your data, then then choose less principal components. So maybe try two or even one to get that correction. You know, at appropriate level to not overcorrect. What data format for genome annotations are supported? Um, so the annotations um, within SVS are, are curated from a variety of sources. And so just for visualization purpose, we directly support visualization of BAM files, VCF files, and BED files. But we, can, we actually have a convert wizard that's built within the software where you can take just about any delimited text format as well as a variety of other formats and convert them into um, a usable annotation track within the software that can be used um, for visualization and also for filtering within the software as well. Um, for an example, like from UCSC, just their, their general um, table exports in delimited text format can easily be converted with our convert wizard to a usable format. In fact, that's how we create that GWAS catalog annotation track that um, I did use earlier. Is there any limitation on the data size? Say if we have 5 million SNPs genotyped across 10,000 subjects, how does the computational time look like on such a data set? So of course we always like to say that there, we, we don't have any hard limits um, to the size of data that can actually be imported and viewed within the software. Um, that being said, there are upper limits that we've run into with the number of samples for instance in computing identity by descent matrices that limit um, right now sits at about um, 50,000 samples um, we are working on improving that we're actually um, right now our developers are working on increasing that limits for our large end customers as far as the number of SNPs go um, there is no limit to the number of SNPs. Um, basically, the only limits you're going to run into is, is hardware limits, so how much RAM do you have available on your computer to hold that information open and do the analysis. Um, time computations for 5 million SIPs, SNPs and 10K subjects, um, you're probably looking at um, a, even a, probably a couple hours to compute identity by descent if you're doing that because it is a sample by sample comparison. Um, so, you know, you're looking at 10K squared um, computations that's happening there. But the actual association tests themselves actually run very quickly. They run one marker at a time. And so, um, you know, you would expect probably maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 15 minutes, I want to say, on a fairly decent um, computer. Once again, that's just, in a, that's just a guess. <laughs> We won't hold you to it, Janet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, what are the file... Sorry, let me reread that. What type file types does SVS accept in order to, to begin association analysis? SVS can import a wide variety of, of data formats. Um, with genotype data, generally, um, if it's SNP data, it's provided from one of the common um, 
you know, SNP array providers, for example, Illumina and AFI metrics. We have very specific importers depending on, on the type of data that you have. Um, of course, if you have the data in just a delimited text file, you can just bring it in. You might have to do some reformatting once it's actually in the software, but we're more than willing to help you out. And we can also, if you can provide us just like a screenshot of what your data looks like, we'll more than willing to point you towards the correct importer um, to get the data ready for analysis. I think Bayes CPI analysis options have been implemented in SVS. What methods can be used? Um, so we've implemented um, Bayes C and Bayes CPI for our genomic prediction um, analysis. And so, so those are the two options that are available within um, genomic prediction is, is one of the things that you can, Bayesian options are available within that particular tool. When you choose which results to use from different methods besides the lambda value, is there any other criteria you would use? Um, and just looking, I mean, just looking at inflation, um, generally just a visual representation of it can be used without actually calculating those lambda inflation factors. We just want to compare how our observed values, the actual p-values that are coming out to our expected values to see um, if there is any inflation in the data. And so in general, um, a lambda value can be used, but visualization is, is just as good. Um, visually, also within the Manhattan plot, what you'll see is, um, you know, if you do have inflated p-values, any of the, the p-values that are not very significant, so the ones that are not genome-wide significant, there's going to be a lot more of them that are a little bit higher. So you'll see a lot of noise towards the bottom of the data, and, you know, you'll still see your peaks for your very significant SNPs, but the rest of the data will just be very noisy. And so just visualize, visualizing is, is a good way to determine that stratification. Okay, how, how can you deal with multiple phenotypes? So uh, in SVS, um, if you're talking about a, like uh, um, um, a multiple phenotypes um, combined together, in the analysis we don't really have any tools that actually deal with them together. We, ha we have ways of running consecutive analysis. So if you have, um, for example, expression data that you're trying to find, um, you know, SNPs of interest for each of that expressions, you know, we have ways of, of, of running the analysis consecutively, so it'll take each um, phenotype individually and test against the software and then it will combine all of the results. Those are add-on scripts that we have available, but we don't have any, any tools that can select, um, you know, multiple phenotypes as your dependent variables at a time. I'm going to take just one more here and then wrap it up, and the questions that haven't been answered, I will get you answers to those. Uh, can you calculate and draw significant threshold, let me start over, <laughs> can you calculate and draw significant threshold lines on the Manhattan plots? So yes, you can, you can definitely go ahead and add vertical lines. Um, or excuse me, horizontal lines for those um, significance thresholds into the software. Um, we don't have any tools specifically that are designed to calculate significant, um, to actually calculate the significance thresholds, but you can draw the lines in once you do know um, where you want to have them. And you just add a straight line to the plot. It's, it's, very, it's fairly straightforward. Alrighty. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you again for an excellent webcast. Um, I will have the recording and slides up on Friday, as I mentioned, and I will be emailing them to you. And I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of their Wednesday.